576. Take the name of Jesus with you.
salvation. Uh, this is, it was, was definitely the plan that God had him for uh, preparing for for this time because he approached the king and the king gave him the permission and everything he needed to go back to Jerusalem to begin this work uh, that he had gotten reports on. Uh, the place I used to work at, uh, we would have turnarounds or outages from time to time. And planning for those uh, was, was very, very detailed. Uh, they would start planning to turn around or an outage uh, a year, year and a half, sometimes two years in advance, depending on the extent of the work. And so they would have meetings, uh, monthly meetings. The closer you got to the time of starting the work, uh, the more frequently you would have these meetings. And the reason for that was, number one, they had to give a report back as to how long this work was going to take. When are you going to be back up and running with your unit? Once you take it down, disassemble it, clean everything, put it back together, how long is it going to take you to get back up and running and back to normal? Well, then you had to start looking at what jobs took the higher priority. What do we need to tackle first? When is this going to be ready? When are you going to have this piece of equipment cleared and ready for maintenance to work on? And then you had to start looking at what work can we do ourselves, and then what work do we have to outsource? So that's kind of what we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, Nehemiah is going to be assessing the damage. He's got permission to go back to Jerusalem, and he has made his way there. Um, and there's a quote. I probably need to get away from that one. Is that ringing to you or just to me? And so up at the top of your outline, your outline tonight is not necessarily one of the normal fill in the blanks uh, like we do uh, most of the time. What you have for your, your outline tonight is going to be somewhat of a homework assignment for you to take home and look at. Uh, the back side, you can use it to write down a few notes as we march through this. But uh, at the top of it is a quote that, that I use for many different applications. Uh, Benjamin Franklin originally said it. Many other people have said it. But Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. One thing you need to do when you go to undertake a project, many of you have been through home remodelings, uh, maybe a car rebuild, something like that. Uh, you know, we talked about this old trunk the other day. If I were to take it apart, I would have to have a plan in place of what I wanted to tackle first, how long it was going to take, and just the process that we needed to go through. So that's basically what Nehemiah is going through now. We read uh, verses 1 through 10 last week. We'll pick up in verse 11 this week, and we'll start looking at what Nehemiah had to do to assess the damage uh, to begin this process. Uh, the Lord had laid it upon his heart. It was obviously that when he got the report back, he was heartbroken over the condition of his city. And I think that what Nehemiah is doing um, is basically he's not just building a wall for protection. He's establishing something that's going to last for generations. Uh, keep in mind that Jerusalem is the city of God. It's where the temple uh, of the Lord is at. Uh, it's where the people would come to worship. Uh, that, and it was where the Holy of Holies was. So his ultimate vision was not just for protection, but he knew that this protection was the first step in a much larger process uh, to restoring a culture true worship of Yahweh. So we go through verses 11 and 12. It says, After I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. So let's stop right there for just a minute. Um, he got up at night, and I got to thinking, you know, if you're going to assess the damage of something, most of the time when you go prowling through a wall or in a dark spot, you want to have something to light up so you can clearly see uh, what's going on. So why did he do this at night? Um, how many of you, does, does God maybe wake up at night to show something to you that you've been asked? Maybe a question that you're looking for an answer for? Maybe it's a passage or a scripture that you've been through. I don't know about you, but sometimes God wakes me up in the wee hours of the morning, and I can't go back to sleep, and that's my time to start praying. God, 
What is it that you want me to do? Are you preparing me for something coming up this day? Are you preparing me for something coming up in, 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 uh, in my future this week, in my life? You know, exactly why did he get up at night and go view this damage? Uh, just remember what happened back in chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, his heart was broken over the condition. He, he said he sat down and he wept and he mourned for a number of days. He was sad by what's going on, his condition. And I think the Lord was speaking to him. And he got him up at night and he wanted to go view this damage. Uh, that had taken place in his hometown of Jerusalem. So do you ever spend the wee hours of the morning seeking God's face? Have you ever spent like a sleepless night, a restless night, that your heart was just so burdened for something that God wouldn't let you sleep, you wanted you to be praying about this situation? That, that's what I thought of whenever I read through this. Why did he get up late at night? Why did he get up in the middle of the night to go view this damage of the wall of Jerusalem. Sometimes we learn our most important lessons during the darkest hour of our life as well. Sometimes when we're going through a darkness, we're, we're seeking after God more than any other time. We don't understand what's going on. We don't really understand why God is allowing this to happen. It just, it's a dark period in our life. But God brings it through us so we can rely on him better. And also so we can see him a lot more clearly. You would think that in order to get a better view of the damage, Nehemiah would have viewed this wall and this city during the daylight hours. Here's what I want you to understand about this. I don't think he wanted to see it with human eyes. I think he wanted to see it with spiritual eyes. I think he wanted God himself to reveal to him exactly what was going on. I might see something one way, and then I start praying about it, and God completely changed my view of that, that matter. He'll show me something completely different. And I think that's what Nehemiah would want to do. He wanted, instead of seeing it all for himself, which he couldn't do at night, he wanted God to clearly show him what needed to be done. Verse 12, uh, the second part of it, there's something unusual there as well. He, he didn't tell anyone else what God laid on his heart to do. Why not? Why would he keep this a secret? Why would he go out in the middle of the night to view this damage and then not tell anyone else about what was going on, what the Lord was laying on his heart? I think there's several different reasons for this, and I think it's an important lesson for us to learn as well. Sometimes you need to get alone with the Lord and really explore the direction He has for you with no external influences. Sometimes you're going to be faced with a decision that if you go get someone else's advice, they might tell you something totally opposite of what God wants to hear. There are times in your life when you need that godly counsel. There are times in your, in your life when you need to consult someone else uh, that has spiritual insight. But most of the times, if it's a very personal decision, if it's a struggle that you're going through, sometimes you don't need that external influence in your life. So, if he kept it to himself, uh, there were no chances of getting advice from the wrong sources. Also, there was no chance of this information getting to the wrong people. And I think the Bible teaches something about being in isolation from time to time to get a crystal clear direction from the Lord. Psalms 48.10 says to be still and know that I am God. And several times you see in Jesus' ministry, where he would intentionally withdraw from the crowds to get along with the Father because he wanted a crystal clear direction, he wanted crystal clear answers, and he didn't want that outside influence. He wanted to get along and get a word completely from the Father. So I think it's real important that he intentionally mentions those two things. He got up at night, he did this under the cover of darkness, but also he kind of did it as a covert operation. He didn't tell anyone else because he didn't want those external influences, uh, maybe to 
of surging, telling him this is too big of a project for you to take on? Well, he clearly stated, this is what God made on my heart. And now I'm going to get up when nobody else is stirring around. I'm going to get up when I can get along with the Lord. And I'm not going to let anybody else know what I'm doing because I want the answers that he's going to give me. In verses 13 through 15, he got up in the middle of the night. He went out under the cover of darkness. And he said, he went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate in the king's pool, but further down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up by night by way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. Now, there are several things to pick up on that. So what he did is he started off at one point and he made kind of a counterclockwise rotation around the city of Jerusalem along the wall. And second everything, he was getting a bird's eye view of the city. I think he was looking at the outside of the walls and the inside of the city. Maybe he was watching, uh, looking at the watchtower to see the damage that was uh, being uh, assessed on those. Uh, but before any progress was made on any project that you do, You've got to have an overall view of what is working and what is not. So, at the place where I used to work at, a chemical plant, the unit that I was in before we undertook a, a turnaround or an outage, those are the things that we needed to know. Uh, what lines are you having issues with? Uh, what pumps are struggling to produce the amount of flow that you need? Uh, what temperatures are you dealing with? What instrumentation is broke? Uh, so he was getting an overall assessment, that's what we do with it in our units before we undertake one of these big projects. We get an overall assessment of everything that is broken, damaged, and needed in repair. And so, uh, back to that comment by Benjamin Franklin, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. He wants this to be a successful adventure. Uh, the Lord has placed it on his heart for him to do this. And now he wants to do it for God's glory. He wants to do it the right way. So what needs to be the top priorities? Those are the questions he's asking. What is a good starting point? What is the overall ultimate goal? And here's what he found on his assessment. The walls are broken down. So number one, my city is susceptible to an enemy attack. Number two, the gates are burned. He noticed that. So there's no need to hang the gates up First, if the walls are defective, kind of putting the car before the horse if you do that. The big question he's asking, what, uh, why are we in the shape that we in? How did this happen? Is there something we can do to prevent this in the future? Also, he's looking and he says, there, it does no good right now to put watchmen up on the wall because even if they gave us a warning, there was no way we could prepare ourselves for an attack because the walls are defective. We have no place to go to defend our city. So I think another one of the questions he's asking, where do I put the first organized group? If I'm going to send people in there to do work, I've got to give them some specific directives. And then how do I get each person going in the right direction? So verse 15, he's up on the wall, he's looking around, he gets a bird's eye view. Then it says he goes to the outside. He goes into the valley. Sometimes when we're looking at the situation, we're on the inside and we're looking out. Sometimes I think we need to do like Nehemiah. We need to go on the outside and look in and see what's going on. One of the first things I did I, when I got here is I, I tried to view myself as a visitor. I tried to come in and see what was going on. What are some of the first things that I make eye contact with? Who are some of the first people that I meet? What am I looking at when I pass by on the road out here? I want, I want to put myself on the outside looking in in a situation that I'm not really familiar with, but maybe pop something possibly I can see to adjust just a little bit to make it uh, functioning more properly. So first of all, he gets up on the wall, he looks around, he gets a, a, a top side view of everything, but then he goes on the outside of the city 
And it says he went down into uh, the valley, inspecting the wall. Still at night, still dark, he see it from a distance. And that goes back to us in our lives as well. Sometimes we learn the most valuable lessons when we go to those deep, dark valleys. Any of you been through one of those lately? Do you learn more about yourself? Do you look back over times in your life when God has brought you through a deep, dark valley? Man, maybe a bad time in your life when you said, I, I just don't know if I'm going to make it through this. Normally that's where you learn your most important life lesson that when you go through those dark valleys of life. You learn more about drawing strength from the Lord when you go through those times as well. And I think that's what Nehemiah is doing. He's getting off alone by himself at night, going through that dark valley, and he's learning what the Lord wants to show him about this upcoming project. He's not seeing it with human eyes. He's seeing it with spiritual eyes. Sometimes you get your most important understanding during the darkest nights of your life. And sometimes you get the most important understanding in the lowest valleys you've ever been in. Verses 16 and 18. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned. Hello, Mr. Obvious. Thank you for pointing that out to us. It's not like we could have seen it ourselves. You had to come here and view this and tell us that. Sometimes we need somebody to point out the elephant in the room that nobody else wants to deal with. Sometimes there's a situation so huge and so obvious to everyone but nobody wants to address it. And I think that's what Nehemiah is doing here. He said, look, guys, hello, look around at what's going on. I, I know you see it. I know you see what needs to be done, but nobody wants to address this particular situation. Why? Because it's overwhelming. Maybe they're not prepared for that. Maybe they don't know how to coordinate all the efforts and get them going in the right direction. But this whole time that Nehemiah has been in captivity in Persia, guess what he's been doing? He's been the governor of the kings. He hasn't just been a servant and a cupbearer, but he's been learning these skills all along. And now God has put him in a place back in his hometown to assess the damage, view the situation, and coordinate the efforts to start this job of rebuilding the wall and put this city back on track where they need to be. So he says, you see the trouble here in Jerusalem? Uh, that Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let us rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. So what the king said to him, that was his first confirmation that he was going to get to do this and this was going to be an excess, uh, a successful adventure. I, I love the question that he asked. You see the trouble that we're in? Don't, don't you see it right before your eyes? Isn't it obvious to you? Why are you not moving? Why are you not doing what it takes to protect and rebuild your city? Sometimes we just need someone to point out the obvious before we're ready to deal with issues. Sometimes we need somebody poking that finger in our chest saying, are you up to the challenge? Are you ready to get started? I know you see the problem. I know you see the issue. But what are you going to do about it? Here's why Nehemiah was the man that stepped out and took the time to do this. Look back at verse 12. He got up at night. He took a few women with him. He didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do. And so 
we just told off all the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, all the people that should have been doing something. But the one man who was really stirred up about this, the one man that God really burned the heart about is the one that stood up and said, look guys, it's time to put a plan in action. God laid it on his heart to do this work. No one asked him to do it. It, it wasn't a paid task for him to do this. He wasn't contracted for this assignment. No one bothered told him that he needed to do this. You ever been bought and told for a job? Your heart's just not in it, is it? Well, you know, Mama told me to do the laundry. I don't feel like folding in the towel right now, so I'll just kind of roll them up, wad them up, and throw them in the closet. <laughs> that sounds too familiar, don't it? But when someone tells you this is what you're supposed to do right now, your heart is really not in it. But when God wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, this is what I want you to do, you have a totally different attitude about the project or whatever it is he's calling you to do. And that's why Nehemiah was the man for this job, because God laid it on his heart. When he was in captivity in Persia, along with some of his fellow countrymen, they were not able to worship Yahweh the way they needed to, the way they were supposed to, and the way they wanted to, because their city lie in ruins. And back in chapter 1, it says his heart was crushed when he heard this message. This, this is not right. This doesn't please the Lord. And now God laid this project upon his heart. Nobody volunteered him to do it. Nobody told him he needed to do it. He just understood what the Lord was telling him. And he went with the initiative of God challenging him. Nehemiah, you're the man for this. You are the man for this day and this time. And you're the one that's qualified to get this job done. We've talked about this in several different studies. Obedience is the key. When he prayed, he prayed as himself as a servant of the Lord. And he asked the Lord, give your servant success in this adventure. And he was obedient to follow what the Lord was commanding him to do. Verse 18. We're going to go back to that again. Because this is real important. All these people approached him. They were questioning him. He pointed it out. You see the trouble that we're in. And then he said, I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. Back in verse 7, he, he's repeating the same thing he said after God granted, after the king granted him permission to go through these countries and get all these uh, materials that he needed. The gracious hand my God was on me. I don't think there was any more words more important than Nehemiah could have said to the people of this city right now than letting them know God has already granted me passage through these countries. He's already granted me permission from the king of Persia to come back and rebuild a city that he probably doesn't want rebuilt at this time. And he said, I've safely, safely passed through all these other countries to get here. Every step of the way, God's hand has been upon me. What he's doing there is he's giving these people his testimony. Look what God has done in my life. Look what God has provided me with. Look what God has granted me to do. Every step of the way, the gracious hand of my God has been on me. So your testimony, the story of your life, what God has blessed you with, the things that God has gifted you with, and the things that God has delivered you from is so important 
it, it's invaluable in helping others gain confidence in what the Lord can do with a life that is fully submitted to Him. I don't think there's anything better that these young people could have heard this morning than the two college students telling their testimony about how their life had been impacted by the gospel and what they are now doing to disciple others in their walk with Christ. And for us to reach the lost, I think you need to start developing the story of your life. I think you need to write it down. We're, we're going to learn in a few weeks about how to outline your personal testimony so you can share it. And just, some say you need, to, you need to be able to share it in less than a minute. Some say you need to have an expanded version of that. We're going to go over every detail of what God has done in your life. What has he put upon your heart to do? What are some of the things that he has delivered you from? What are some miracles that you've seen God do in your life, in your church, in your family throughout the years? You, you are living proof that God does miracles because your life is a miracle. And that's what Nehemiah is saying right here. He said, everything that God has brought me up to to this point for this project is because God's gracious hand has been upon me. And so now I'm convinced, Nehemiah said, now I am totally convinced that there's nothing stopping us from rebuilding this wall and putting this city back on track to where it needs to be. And why was God's hand on Nehemiah? Was it because he wanted to make the city of Jerusalem safer? I simply rebuild the wall? No, not at all. His ultimate goal was to bring the temple, uh, to bring the people back to the temple in the true heart of worship for them. So as I got to thinking about that, now we are the temple of the living God. And he wants us in the best condition possible. And we are to protect our temple at all costs. Proverbs 4.23 says to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. So in Hezekiah's reform, thinking back to our study of Hezekiah, what was one of the, his important steps as well? To return to worship the one true God. That was his whole concept of doing this reformation. So that's now what Nehemiah is thinking as well. My ultimate goal is not just to protect the city, but I want to put it in a safe enough state where we don't have to worry about the enemies on the outside. We can come in and we can worship God the way that we want to and the way that we're supposed to. And after he told him this testimony, look at what happened. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. The Amplified Version says that they thoroughly supported the good work. If you don't, if you got a highlighter, highlight that verse, that part of the verse, the second half of 18, certainly put a star by it or something, because that's the attitude that we need to have right now. We see God's gracious hand upon a project. We see what needs to be done. We just need a direction. And now we want our hands to be strengthened to start this rebuilding project. Not only was he assessing the damage of the city, what else was he doing? He was assessing the spirits of the people that he was going to be working with. He wanted to see what attitude that they had during this time. He wanted to see the attitude of the people that would be involved in the overall process of rebuilding the walls and restoring this city. They said, let's start rebuilding. They, they were chopping at the pits. They were ready to do it right then. I think they would, if they would have had all the materials in place, these people were encouraged enough by Nehemiah and his words to say, let, let's just get it. Let's do it. Let's, let's get on it right now. What are we waiting for? That's how fired up they were. And that's how I want to be as well. I want to know that God has given us a crystal clear directive 
I want to know that we've spent the time organizing a detailed plan. I want to know that we've set the right priorities on the right things and we have the right people encouraged with the right attitude moving at the same pace to do this work. I want to be like Eliezer. If you've been reading through your Bible study in, in a year, you just went through a story about David and his mighty men. You read about a man by the name of Eliezer. He fought so hard, he fought so long that his hands were cramped up on his sword, and they had to pry his fingers loose from it. And when we start this work, that's the attitude we need to have. I'm going to grab hold of what God wants me to do. I'm going to grab hold of my part, my position. And I'm not going to let go until my job is completed. And that's what I get out of what Nehemiah has told these people to do. And that's what I get out of this comment in verse 18. When they said, they, they heard the word and said, all right, let's do it. Let's start this rebuilding right now. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. But when you start moving in the direction that the Lord wants you to move in, here's one sure sign of knowing that you're on the right track. Here's one sure sign of know <laughs> that you're doing exactly what the Lord wants you to do. You can expect criticism because it's going to come. Nehemiah's fired up. The people of the city that are going to help him, they're fired up. And in verse 19, here comes the minority reports. When Sanballat, Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I think some people have the natural gift of discouragement. I think some people, all they have to do is open their mouth and, and discouragement comes out. And I hate to hear someone downplaying a person that is trying to do the right thing. Each and every one of us needs to be an encourager to the other person. They're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. It, it's going to seem like they're doing something foolish from time to time. But if they're trying to do the right thing, do your best to give them some encouragement. So what was the reason behind these guys? They, they thought that what Nehemiah and these people were doing were, were somewhat of a, a political move. They thought it was somewhat of a rebellious act. Uh, that they want to be stronger than some of the nations around us. They want to start building up uh, the city of Jerusalem. So they started making fun of them. They mocked them and despised them. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I'm doing what the Lord has laid upon my heart to do. And nothing else. That's it. So just keep in mind, going downhill is easy. It doesn't take much effort. The most resistance comes when you're moving uphill, getting higher and higher and closer to the Lord. We used to go snow skiing in Colorado. Learning how to snow ski was the first biggest challenge. And the most important thing they teach you to do is to stop. Because if you don't know how to stop correctly, you're going to run into someone and you're going to get hurt. Why do you need to learn how to stop? Because going downhill is easy. You just kind of glide along and move along. But if you don't know how to stop, you're going to wreck at some point. Getting down the mountain was the easy part. Well, for some people. <laughs> if you got injured along the way, the, uh, the rescue team came and helped you out, and then getting down the hill was real easy then, but you were strapped into a basket. Getting up the hill was the hardest part. So, if you wanted to get up the hill, you had to either take your skis and sidestep, 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 until you got up as high as you wanted to go, or you had to wait in a long lift line Hop on the ski lift, and with a motorized contraption, go all the way up the mountain. And it would take you a lot longer to get up the mountain most of the time than it would to get back down. When we start
start this rebuilding project. It's not going to be easy. How will we know we're going in the right direction? It's going to be work. It's going to be laborious. It might get bogged down from time to time. We might receive a lot of criticism from time to time, but that's okay. If we've prayed about it, if the Lord has laid it upon our heart, we know for sure that this is what we need to do, God's going to be in it. He's going to bless it. His gracious hand is going to be upon us. But in your life, when you start a rebuilding process in your own life, when you, when you get that plan developed, you know where you want to go, you've got some goals set, it's not going to be easy. And that's how you'll know when you're going in the right direction. When you start receiving that friction, when you start receiving that resistance, You'll know you're going in the right direction. And Satan's going to be against you every step of the way. That's another way. Those attacks start coming on harder, more frequently, and you get discouraged. But if, if, if your hands are strengthened, you set your mind to it, God's placed it on your heart. No matter. So here's a few questions that I have for you. Kind of goes along with your homework uh, for your outline sheet. So is, is God asking you to do something that you've never attempted before? Is he kind of pushing you out of your comfort zone? Is he causing you to stay up late at night? And is he giving you visions and dreams of something that is totally for me. Maybe he's placing something on your heart to do. Maybe you're the person for this time right now. Maybe you're the person for this particular ministry right now. Is he giving you certain confirmation on things that are so specific that it is just undeniable that like Nehemiah, you can only say the gracious hand of my God has been upon me. So the first confirmation that Nehemiah received was the permission from the king of Persia. Second confirmation he received that he easily passed through all these uh, other countries that were hostile. Probably didn't want him in the neighborhood. But he also received the materials and the permission to do this work for the city of Jerusalem. And I think the third confirmation that he received is a response from the people. He told them the plan. He pointed out the elephant in the room. He pointed out the thing that nobody else wanted to deal with. And then all the people gathered around and said, okay, let's start this rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. So in your quiet time this week, uh, I want you to do uh, a few assessments. Uh, get you out a notebook if you're going to start keeping notes on this. If you haven't started a journal yet, this is a good opportunity for you to start doing this. Uh, you, you just get you a sheet of paper, something to write on. Uh, do like me and I, maybe get up in the wee hours of the morning or during the middle of the night or whenever the Lord stirs your heart and start looking at this real close. Number one, do some damage assessment. First of all, on your nation. I think the elephant is in the room there. I think it's pretty obvious as to what's going on. But not only do you write down the condition that it's in, what the Lord is showing you, but you're also going to see what can I do to be involved in the work of the Lord in my nation. Second of all, do an assessment on your community. A little bit closer to home. What's going on here in Morgan City? What is the Lord laying upon my heart? What am I praying about that I can be involved in? What are some things that I see that no one else sees? Am I praying about this? Is he showing me some confirmation through his word? Write down some conditions that you see in your community and then how the Lord wants you to be involved in those. 
Number two, do an assessment of your own family. My relatives, my loved ones, what am I seeing that nobody else is seeing? Is, it, is there an elephant in the room in my family, something so obvious that nobody else wants to deal with it? But I see it, I understand why it's there, I understand why it's going on, and then start asking the Lord, what do I need to do to make this condition better? But most of all, do an assessment of yourself. Are you on the outside looking in? Are you on the inside looking out? Are you seeing what everybody else sees? Is there some stuff that you're not wanting to deal with in your life? So just do a little, a little survey of what's going on in your life and then ask the Lord about Place your finger on, on an area of my heart that I need to deal with. Something that I've been putting off for a long time. Something I know is not right. Something that's out of order. And then ask yourself, and ask the Lord, ask the Lord to help you to devise a precise plan of what you can do to start making the necessary repairs. Just, just like this old truck. I'm gonna, I might leave this up here for a few weeks because I have a lot of people asking about it. Yeah, and it's just like this. A lot of us uh, will look at that. Uh, somebody's going to initially say, well, yeah, but the engine needs to be old enough. That's all that's wrong with that truck, and they'll just go on their way. Some of you say, you know, I don't really like the color of that. I think we need to change the color of it. Uh, somebody will say, well, the lid needs to be addressed first, but it's not working out. We're, we're all going to see something a little bit different about it. We're going to approach it a little bit differently. And so to begin this restoration process, this process of rebuilding, we can't just go off on my vision. I've got to take some input from other people. But just like me and mine, I'm going to go ahead and give you this warning right now. Sometimes there's going to be some times when I don't talk to nobody. <laughs> I don't want to be around nobody. I don't want those outer influences persuading my decision. I want to get along with the Lord. And I want to say, Lord, give me a plan. Give me a vision. Show me maybe something that nobody else is seeing that we need to deal with. But there's going to be other times when I'll get together with a group of people and say, all right, let's do some brainstorming. Tell me what you're seeing right now. And I think that's pretty much what Nehemiah is doing in his assessment here of the city of Jerusalem. So you write this list down, do all the assessments of your nation, your community, your family, yourself. Do one of our churches as well. Pray about this. Ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want our church to do? What is our little niche? What is the one little thing that we can do well right now? What are we equipped to do right now? both physically and spiritually. Write all this down on a sheet of paper and let this guy your prayer life for a few days and see what the Lord reveals to you. And then eventually we'll get together and see if we're all on the same track and we're through. seeing the same thing or not. I, I see so many similarities in this story. I mean, I and if you look at the Bible I'm using right now, the highlights and underlines that I got is God's showing me a lot of stuff, not only about my life, but about what we're doing here as well. So I'm excited about this study. Uh, I'm excited uh, ready to start the rebuilding process. Yeah. Got a hymn of invitation for us? Yeah, I have. Okay. I thought you had one on the, on the board. Let's all uh, just bow our heads real quick few moments to think about uh, what we just learned in this assessment process and, and where we go from here with it. Father God, we love you so much. Thank you for all you're doing for us. Our heart's desire is to serve you, and to please you, and to understand what you've placed on our hearts to do, Lord. 